very good morning to all of you first of all i would like to welcome all of you to the second day first session of ai learning summer school program so uh, for today's talk uh, i would like to welcome mr abhijit parida who will deliver his talk on computer vision so let me give a, give a short uh, intro about uh, mr abhijit parida so uh, abhijit parida is an r&d develop engineer devops engineer at the shaikh jayed institute for pediatric innovation at the children's national hospital in washington ds usc he works on creating and implementing cutting edge deep learning based computer vision ai into pediatric cancer diagnosis his research interests include few short learning self supervised learning and semantic segmentation and he has obtained his masters of science in computational science and engineering from the technical university of munich germany where he majored in deep learning for uh, medical imaging he also completed his btech with distinction in mechanical engineering mechanical engineering at the amrita vishwa vidyalaya bangalore so i would like to welcome mr abhijit parida now uh, you can take your session thank you yeah thank you uh, sudhan sharma thank uh, thank you everyone for joining in good morning everyone so so can uh, someone confirm that you can see my slides yeah it's visible yes yeah yeah it's visible yeah right so yeah today uh, i'm going to give some kind of an intro into computer vision so what computer vision is all about and let's see let's go and start so before that uh, i uh, before that i would like to tell something about myself uh, so as sudhanshu has already kind of given a uh, brief intro about it so i will keep it short so it's basically i worked as a, a data scientist uh, before and then now i'm working in this children's national hospital uh, regarding uh, healthcare and its applications how uh, ai is helping healthcare so something just to give like a brief introduction what ai in healthcare can do i have these two open models what we had developed in the past and i could just uh, quickly show you uh what it's all about so the first one is some kind of a neural network based segmentation for ms lesion so ms lesion is nothing but it's called multiple sclerosis so the brain uh starts to get affected uh mostly at old age so you can say this is like a scan of a patient and what multiple sclerosis looks like is this white patches so there are multiple of them so that's where the names come from so you have multiple patches and then you just simply run this command you can try it at home anyone can if they have docker installed you run this command it takes a patient's uh, scan something like this and then outputs okay these are the regions which have been affected by multiple sclerosis right so then the other thing is um, more colorful again related to brain so in our brains we have something called as white matter gray matter and some cerebrospinal fluid so this model another very simple model um using ai how uh, so the radiologists can now identify which is the region which is exactly white matter as you can see in this red color is the region which is showing white matter and gray matter so the green path and there is some fluid which is called the cerebrospinal fluid which is shown in purple i'm not sure if you can see it but it should be there and other regions which are neither of these three is not being done anything as you can see the skull has been excluded and all that so you can see that this task uh, is uh, provides a lot of value to uh, the medical imaging domain uh, but is based completely on computer vision uh so that's where uh we are going to talk about the vision aspect um, so let me go back to my slides right so we are going to talk about what is computer vision why computer vision is a hard uh, topic uh then for the basics we would start with what is a vision uh, image 
what is a video what are some of the major image processing techniques that can be done and how these techniques would come together and then we might actually have some time to do a live demo of a task we look into it and then some outlook and outro right so what is computer vision so vision for human beings is the most uh, i would say the most important uh, sensory uh, type because we actually base most of our tasks based on whatever we see uh, uh, i see this pc in front of me you are seeing you are learning from seeing most of the times so what does vision systems include so let's say i try to look at this picture i have the eyes which capture all the light coming in and then sends it to process uh, to a computer which is for us is the brain so the brain goes about interpreting that okay we have a red light we have a yellow light uh, we have a black light so what does these all these lights mean together and the brain interprets and tells me okay there is a bowl there are some oranges bananas peaches whatever so it's a combination of both the sensing device which is the eyes and the brain which helps us in interpretation so let's try to think in terms of the computer what happens we again have the same image we have a sensing device which is a camera so the camera captures the light coming in creates an image but still it's not known what that image is then the interpretation happens on our cpus uh, where there is some kind of algorithms which have been uh, already uh, like installed in our computers uh, which kind of help you to identify okay uh, it's a bowl it's a peach the peach is inside the bowls all these interpretation happens on the computer based on algorithms and what are some of these algorithms would be talked about in some time so what are some things that we can do with computer vision so i call cv task so the task that we can do the simplest task is image classification so you have this image of here of a dog uh, so the computer has to recognize what the object in that image is so here it does it as a dog the other one is object detection so we have might have multiple uh, objects in one image so the idea would be to first classify all the objects that are present in that image and then identify the regions where these objects are so these uh, regions have been highlighted by these uh, blue boxes called bounding boxes so they bound so for this dog this is the bounding box so this bounding box contains the entirety of the dog there like for example the cat you can see there has a red color bounding box so it differentiates uh, cat from the dog and you can see we can differentiate dog one from dog two now you can see that the bounding box is not really a good measure because you have other regions which have also been classified as dogs like these white patches here or maybe i can just um yeah so these white patches here um have been identified as a dog but for us we know that they are not dogs so we go to one step further called as semantic segmentation so the each image consists of pixels and we go about classifying each of the pixels so we say so the pixel out here belongs to a dog the pixel out here belongs to the background so this is how we go about doing a pixel level classification then we can further go on to identify this as a separate dog from the other dog so this is called instant segmentation right so as we now the thing is most of the uh, tasks or most of the descriptions are mostly based on cats and dogs and not on like the real life scenario so i just wanted to draw some parallels between uh, image classification pictures and how they can be used in real life so here there is an example of how image classification can be used to identify if the crowds are dense or not so yes or no kind of a thing dense crowd not dense crowd object identification like how we have identified a dog out here is uh, from a satellite image It helps us to identify okay this is a cargo plane out here and the others are not cargo plane then semantic segmentation this is something that is uh, actively used in the google maps that you see to identify which is the road the parts mentioned in yellow and which are not road like buildings parks or roundabouts whatever so this 
helps uh, Google Maps to identify where the roads are, and then it can go about showing you the correct routes. Then the other thing is instant segmentation. So this is uh, this helps again from Google Maps to identify two separate buildings. So this is also building. The other one is also a building. Now we can identify the regions which are building one, building two. So for example, this is my house, this is my friend's house, and we can identify these are two separate houses. So these are some parallels that you can draw between the tasks that we see in general described and what happens in real life. So what are some of these um, applications? So the one of the major applications is uh, OCR or optical character recognition. So we have seen a lot of these kind of uh, palm leaf scripts, which uh, have been used as some kind of medium to store information in the past. So um, a lot of them needs to be digitized because we are or we might lose information from them. So a simple uh, process that has been designed or was in place before was just to take a picture or scan the document uh, and they would stop there. But, you know, there is a problem there. Like, for example, in this image, I don't know where which parts of the image correspond to what uh, entity or something. Like if I had to search for a word in this image, I can't. I can't search in images. So now people are uh, thinking of taking it a step further to apply OCR so that they uh, identify each of the characters and then they can be stored in a text document format. So you can like read it as a book and you can search it. You can do further analysis on it. So the, now the OCR pipeline instead of just stopping at image files goes from image files to OCR till the text documents. See so the other one, which I think most of you would have seen is this face detection. So the uh, face detection is, um, you see there is an image and the, the face of this young lady and the girl has been identified. So you have already seen it in your mobile phone cameras. Uh, so Sony was one of the first to come out with it. So it identifies the bounding box of your face. And you might think, okay, why is it important? Because then once you know that this region is a face, you can apply a lot of other post-processing algorithms on it, like uh, what do you call as blemish removal or wrinkle removal, all kinds of uh, algorithms that are focused for the face and not necessary for something like this bandana or for the hair or something like that. And then Sony also came up with this Sony smile shutter. So you just have to keep your uh, selfie camera on and then give a really nice smile and it would click a photo. So you can be assured that your photos always have the best possible smile and not that when you're frowning upon someone random click a picture of you. Right, so the other one is a facial recognition. I mean, uh, most of the iPhone users or most phones nowadays anyways have this open your phone using uh, the scan of the face. So you just have the phone in front of your face. It scans your face identify certain important points that it's looking for, looks the ratio between them and if it matches the template and it's like, okay, yeah, this is my phone open being opened by me and it accepts. So something uh, what I recently faced, I can uh, talk about is called ID card, uh, ID card scanning. Uh, so initially when I used to go to my office pre-pandemic, I had to scan my ID card on a machine like this. So there is this place where I scan my ID card, I put my fingerprint and the door opens. But what happened in pandemic was there's this problem of if I keep my fingerprints there, then the next person may not sanitize it. And uh, it's a like a, maybe a source of spread of COVID. So they upgraded all the systems to a visual based systems. So, so it, it is something like this. So now I have to go keep my ID card here. It retrieves my information. It retrieves my photo. And then when I uh, go stand in front of the camera, it tries to match the photo in the ID card to the photo um, or to the image that's being displayed in the camera. Once that matches, it opens the door for me. So this is something like uh, more and more people are using facial uh, recognition based entry system. In past movies, I've seen a lot of them having uh, retina scans also for the Aadhaar we use 
a lot of retina scanning, which is also an application of a computer vision task for identification. Right. Uh, another interesting one is Google Lens. So it's actually, um, it's got a really nice motto also search with your camera. So imagine you go to a, a party and you'd say, okay, a acquaintance of yours has worn a really nice dress and you want that. You could just simply click a photo of it. And then the, uh, based on the photo, the Google algorithm search for similar dresses. And then it shows, okay, this is the dress, this is the price, are you willing to buy it or not? Another thing is you can easily identify animals like the breed of the dog, for example. Like, uh, you see a lot of dogs on the street and you just want to know, okay, is that XYZ breed or ABC breed? How do I do it? In the past, it was very difficult. You had to find a person who knew dog breeds and to do it. Now you just point your Google phone with Google Lens on it and they just uh, kind of uh, identify the dog breed for you. Another one is something like uh, scan a text and it would identify actions. Again, an OCR kind of an application, all in one in Google Lens. So this is um, if uh, most of you uh, have seen sports ever, a lot of uh, computer vision goes into uh, most of the tasks there. The simplest one is uh, the, uh, how it's called the DRS or dishes and review system. Like for example, there is a baller here and uh, there is some kind of a disagreement between the umpire's decision and the player's decision. And uh, the computer vision algorithm is called in. So what does the computer vision algorithm do? In the red, you can see the path that was followed by the cricket ball. And based on this trajectory of the ball, uh, the computer vision algorithm, apart from tracking, also tries to predict where the ball could be. The, the blue line suggests where the ball could have gone in the future if the batsman had not intervened. And based on this, they can kind of identify if the umpire's uh, call was correct or incorrect. The other thing that is common um, across all sports is this ball tracking application. So most of the time you would have seen that the uh, camera angles are really well set so that they can track the ball really well. So what they do is basically, um, for example, here the uh, algorithm shows the ball has been put in a bounding box, a blue bounding box. So the uh, camera systems now identify where the ball is and try to place it somewhere in the middle of the screen. And based on its past movement, try to predict the place where it could be next. So sometimes you might see this algorithm also going bad because you, know, uh, you think that the ball has gone at one point and the camera is following there, but then the screen is cut and they show to you the original path of the ball because you know the algorithm had failed somehow there. So these are some uh, techniques uh, like the sports ball tracking is being used actively in cameras. Right, so the other thing is uh, medical imaging. So I have some uh, live things because I'm anyways working on this. I have some de uh, anonymized uh, data so I can show it to you. Let me just quickly go there. Right, so this is a viewer that's uh, used uh, professionally um, to look at uh, images of the brain or any kind of a medical image. So medical image is a special kind of image. It's not a normal 2D image and it's a 3D image. And that's why I wanted to show it on a, this viewer rather than on the slide. So I click and drop the CT scan of a patient. This is how the head of a patient looks like and then I can do some kind of processing like this is called um, yeah so for example I know the value so I can easily put it so I do some kind of image processing to uh, get the so this is what you generally see this is the brain of a person thankfully this person does not suffer from any ailments i wouldn't be able to tell anyways just because i knew it i'm telling you 
so a uh, doctor just basically goes through the scan like scrolling up 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 till he finishes the scan so this is a really problematic scenario because if i'm looking at one scan is okay but if i look at hundreds of scans it's a repetitive task and it is uh, humans are not really good at any repetitive task Com machines on the other hand excel at such kind of a task like repetitive look at different scans look at in all three views like this is the view coming from the back of the head to the front of the head and this is from the top to the bottom and this is from the left to the right so uh, computers really excel at it so something i can show a scan of one person who's suffering from uh, multiple sclerosis um, right so this is the mri scan of a person and as i said multiple sclerosis is like some kind of white patches that appear in the brain so i will scroll down through you if if you see some white patches you know okay that that those are the patches that are affected by multiple sclerosis so one easy one is this one here uh, let's look in this view so it it is difficult um, i have i can only identify maybe a couple of them so what i can do is um, ask the ai algorithm to segment it for me and i had already done it and let's see how it look looks like so this is what the ai algorithm tells us so the ai algorithm tells us that um, so these are the regions that are most likely affected so right so these are the some of the major application of uh, of computer vision now let's uh, try to see what are the basic requirements that we can uh, or basic algorithms probably uh, or no before that we have to discuss why is it hard so if, when i went to google i searched for konark sun temple so you can see this image of all of most of the images of sun temple so we all agree that these are all images of the sun temple and why is it problematic for the computer to identify so you can see that this is one viewpoint of the sun temple which is very different from the viewpoint over here um this and these two viewpoints kind of match i think they are from the same place yeah they are from the same place so yeah but you see in general there are like so many different viewpoints for a computer it is very difficult to identify okay, if this is also konark temple then how is this also konark temple so that is a problem uh, the other thing with visionary systems is the lighting so there you can see that this probably has been taken at a different time of the day and this has been taken and has been uh, processed in such a way that the lighting is like yellowish in color and this is blue in color so maybe the computer learned that konark temple always has a blue sky which is not true so we have to generalize for lighting you can see all kinds of different kind of lighting like there is clouds in the sky also giving a different lighting the other thing is scale so you can see that uh, the the temple itself occupies certain ratio of the entire image so they are different in the different images so here the temple occupies a much lesser space say compared to here here the temple occupies the majority of the space so these uh scale of different images for the same object can also be different uh the other problem is camera limitation like we might have trained algorithms to work on super high resolution cameras but in on the field sometimes we don't have those cameras we have to make do with simpler easier uh cameras or uh, maybe someone is using low resolution cameras um or someone is using uh the cameras that are um, like non digital in nature so all these is also a limitation the the sensing device for us can be wide variety i mean there are also cameras with other attributes like rgb d which is depth also capturing so they are also a different thing the other thing is mostly uh comes with images of people or something is occlusion uh, and obvious uh, obvious uh, obfuscation yeah it's a mouthful kind of a thing so these are the thing that um this images sometimes can be uh, blocked from our view 
for example this lady actually is preventing the view to the temple or a lot of crowd here so this is um, maybe a truck stands in the way and we cannot take a good photo so occlusion is a big problem the other one is because this is a pixel data someone can add random values to pixel though to our eyes they look normal uh, but the pixel value changes and it might be a problem so we can see why this change of pixel value might be a problem later on so this is uh 101 what is a image so image is basically a combination of multiple pixels so pixel is nothing but some kind of a, a point in the um, some kind of a uh, like a point which has x and y values uh, and then e at each of these points there may be a value that ranges between 0 to 255 so you can see that if I had to write this number eight, uh, I have this kind of a matrix and I fill it with values ranging from zero to 255. Um, so the zero corresponds to nothing that is black and 255 corresponds to everything that is white. So the smallest value possible is zero and the biggest value possible is 255. So that is the range of pixel values in most images. Mm. So for us, it's easy to say, okay, X, Y, and the value inside, but the computer needs a notation for it. And the notation that the computer uses uh, is a matrix. So, you know, this pixel uh, image can be converted to a matrix. So each location in the matrix has some kind of a value, which would be between zero and 255. Uh, right, so that is what an image is, and uh, this is what a grayscale image is. Now, let's see how to add color. So, in um, color, we basically have three kinds of, or the most common uh, image is an RGBA image. So, they have three types of um, channels so, red channel, green channel, blue channel, and I'll come to the A channel at the end. Uh, so, it tells us let's say this is the image of a bird so it has a red channel a green and a blue channel so the red channel is supposed to tell me how much of redness is present at one pixel value so if i go to this pixel value it has x redness amount a greenness amount and b blueness amount all these three together can be seen as a single color so you can see in this picture of this lady so you can see like uh, at this corner, the red is super bright. So a lot of red, a lot of green, but no blue. And that forms this orangish kind of a color. Like you can see with her hair as well. Again, a lot of red, a lot of green, but no blue. So it's kind of a blonde hair. So how does these uh, multiple colors come together? We have this kind of a like a color palette where we can select. So, so it says yellow, green. So anything in, so the main colors are yellow, sorry, main colors are green, red, and blue. And anything in between can be just um, interpolated by different values of red and green. Between here is different values of blue and red and so on to form the colors. So what are like the, um, different color values that are possible. So if we go back to the pixel notation, there are 256 numbers that can fit here from zero to 255. Similarly out here and also in the, uh, uh, like the blue channel. So if we take the combinations that are possible in a single pixel, you can see that's a really large number. So it's close to a crore of a num uh, 1.6 crore uh, colors are possible by just putting different values of red, green, and uh, blue. So the, the final thing is the alpha channel. So this is most commonly seen in, in PNG kind of image. So as you can notice in this, this is an image that I put, but have you ever seen a circular image? No, or even an irregular image. So how do they come up with these kind of images is 
they set a, a value to this particular pixel. It tells us how much transparency should be have. If it's completely transparent, you see that I can see the slides from the behind, or I can see that, yeah, exactly, I see the slides from behind. And if it's not transparent, as in the, um, uh, the black pixels, I can see them as a black color. So the, there is so in only not, not, not only three channels, but it'll be a fourth channel, which again goes from zero to 55, telling us how much transparency should, should I add. So if it's 100% transparent, I see the thing in the back. If it's not transparent at all, I don't see it. Right. So then the other important thing is, um, what is a image resolution? Uh, so the thing is image resolution is defined as the number of pixels that can be fit into an inch of a screen. So if, so for me on my screen, this is one inch. So the number of pixels that I can fit in defines the resolution of that image. So I can fit in one, two, three, four, five. So five and the, in the, the, the units are pixel per inches or in other places, it's also called dots per inches. So it's PPI or DPI. So higher resolution means higher dots per inches. So here you can see there are 300 dots per inches and you can quite clearly see it's a circle rather than here, I would have guessed it was a square. So um, it is, uh, so higher resolution can give us more information, uh, but that's not always true. For example, I can from this 72 DPI also identify that it was a circle and it's pretty good circle, which uh, I didn't need to use 300 DPI at all. So uh, that's a thing. How much resolution is good enough is something that uh, uh, you have to decide with based on the resources. Um, because this is something that I always also talk to with my parents, like uh, on our Tata Sky, we have these options of HDTV. So when we had a standard definition TV, and we subscribe to HDD, we, it didn't make any difference for us because it was coming at 300 DPI, but I could only display it at 20 DPI. So there was no change seen. But once we upgraded to an HDTV and watch an HD channel, you could clearly see the difference between a standard definition channel and a high definition channel. And um, you can always convert resolutions uh, like go from five to 10 or 10 to five but you have to keep in mind that there is always a loss of information. So for example, if I went from, from this guy, it's the same image in a uh, different resolution. If I, I can easily change it from uh, a high resolution to a low resolution, but you can see that it's already become blurry. And now if I had to go back to the other direction, it would become even more blurrier. And I we will talk about how we can do this change of resolution and resize in detail later. Right, so what is a video? So a video is uh, nothing but like uh, multiple images that are stacked together. So how a video is taken is that a camera starts taking pictures of an event, very fast, multiple pictures. So like one picture now in hundredth of a second, next picture and so on. So it captures like this, this guy is throwing something it captures this image, this image, all the images out here. And then when you see these images moving uh, or put next to each other really fast, you think that the entire sequence is being done. Um, so the unit out here is frames per second. You must have already heard of it. So uh, most cameras um, would capture different frames per second. You can vary it. So if you have a high frames per second, you would capture more frames like you can see in this image. If you have a lower one out here, the important thing is we should be capturing at least 15 frames per second. Otherwise our eyes will be able to distinguish that these are two different images and not like a video action. So uh, if you've seen any stop motion animation, they are generally in the range of 17 to 18. So you, you are able to visualize, okay, there is something stopping and moving. Uh, and so, like uh, the other thing is that uh, these frames per motion, uh, sorry, the frames per second can also give you an effect of slowness 
or fastness. So we have this ball. This ball is moving at 15 frames per second and the other ball is moving at 120 frames per second. To, to me, it looks as if the 15 frames per second reaches the top first compared to the 120 seconds. But it's not true, actually. It's just a visual um, trick that the 120 frames, because we are seeing more and more frames of it, we feel that it's kind of going slower and reaching the end uh, slower. Uh, in general, slow motion cameras are doing something around 1,500 to 2,000 frames per second. So you see those images where you see bullets and the shock waves around the bullets. So those are captured at at least 2,000 to 2,500 frames per second. Right. Mm, then, yeah. So what is image processing? Uh, so we've seen that the mathematical uh, equivalence of a matrix is sorry, of a picture is matrix. So we can modify these matrix values by using different algorithms. And these algorithms are nothing but image processing algorithms. So they are done to enhance sometimes. Okay, sometimes we don't see certain images really well, or sometimes uh, we just want to know what the content of an image is. So these algorithms help to identify that. And you, this is actually what is in the background when you do Photoshop an image. It's, so you can actually use most of these techniques to uh, like circumvent uh, Adobe Photoshop or something like that. So the most common technique that I guess everyone has used is image cropping. So like I've taken a picture of this poppy flower and I just want to focus on the flower and remove the green. I don't care about this yellow flower anymore. So it is the process of selecting a region which I'm interested in. So how do I go about, I want this region. So I knew that this was a matrix. So I can select, okay, can you get me the rows from uh, this row to this row and the columns from here to here. So in Python, I would write something like this for this image. This is an image of an eight and I just want the center one. So I just write rows here to here and columns this to that. And I would get cropped images. So this is what my image crop, I mean, this is the most basic and most widely used technique. The other thing I was talking about resizing, like we move from a square that's super, like, let's say I assume each of these big square represent a pixel. So I want to go from a two by two image to a four by four image. So how can I do that? Uh, so you can see that I only have real values for the corners. I don't have any values for which are white. So we need some kind of an interpolation algorithm to fill up these white spaces. Uh, so one of the most simplest one is nearest neighbor. So I go to this box and I see, does my left neighbor have a color? Uh, yes, white, no, oh, sorry, red, sounds good. My right neighbor, white, okay, no color. My, all my other neighbors have no color. So, okay, my nearest neighbor is red. So I color that. I go to this one, then I see, okay, um, my neighbor, does it have a color? No, it does not have a color. Um, this one, no, here, no, but at the nearest to me is blue. So I just color that. So after we fin fit in all the things based on nearest neighbor, we get some kind of a box like this. So if I had an original image that looked like the stick man, nearest neighbor would give me something like this. The other one, which is more widely used is the bilinear interpolation gives you some uh, from the stickman gives you a better image but you can see that sometimes um, it's problematic and we'll see why it's problematic um, so what happens so i do some kind of to come up to the color that i should fill here what i do is i do an interpolation between the red and the blue right so that interpolation value and I do interpolation between all of these, all the pairs. So four, five, uh, there are four pairs. I do interpolation and then take, which is the uh, value that I should be putting it here. So out here, the only interpolation that I would care about is between the red and blue. Out here, I would care about the interpolation uh, between the red and the purple 
the blue and the green to come up with a value over here. So that if I did bilinear interpolation, it need it no longer, for example, here there were only white and black. Here there can also be gray values. So it is better. But in general, you've seen that a standing stick figure has become a walking stick figure. So the other uh, um, right. So one more thing that I want to tell is um, it is very different from uh, padding. So we could have uh, put white pixels around this box rather than actually filling the box with colors over here. So that process would have been called padding. Padding means you add uh, pixels around the existing image and not try to uh, fit uh, pixels in between the image. So the difference is resizing fits pixels between the image, padding only outside the image. Right. The other one is flipping, uh, mirroring, and rotating. So we have the original picture. Of course, you know, flip means the top comes down to the bottom and the bottom stays there. So I hold the image and then just flip it over. I can flip it the other way around also. The other thing is mirror. So it's as good as you putting a mirror out here and then this the mirrored image. Mm, some of you also must have seen like uh, rotation. So this is my original picture of a watermelon and I rotate it. it says here it says 34 degrees. So the watermelon went for 34 degrees anti-clockwise in 34 degrees. Clockwise is given by a negative number in this uh, coordinate system, but it depends completely on different uh, pro uh, programming language how you're doing it. So one important uh, task also uh, is um, conversion from color to gray. So the thing is that uh, as we might think it is important, but um, color actually does not provide much information to us. It just tells you, okay, the redness of the parrot is there, but it doesn't help us in identifying where the parrot is, what the background of the parrot is, uh, well, you can always argue that the parrot is red and the background is green, so I have, I'm able to identify that. But it's not necessary that I store three different channels just for that, which we'll see later. Um, it is possible to be only judged using a single channel. So now I have a color image. How do I go from this color image to the gray image? So what I do, so this is the, my red channel, my green channel, and my blue channel. So the most basic thing is I take an average of all these three. And when I take an average, I just get a single channel. That's my gray image. But uh, in general, we do not do that or that's not the most common uh, technique because um, we as human beings perceive some colors better compared to other colors. So we also add some kind of a weighted uh, some technique. So we weight the different colors differently. Um, yeah. So the other thing is, this is still uh, a single channel and it has values between 0 and 255. So it could be any values, integer values between 0 and 255. <clears throat> now we need to compress this image. So we, the, the most uh, compressed value would be if you can store between 0 and 1 binary uh, numbers. So thresholding helps us in binarizing images. What's the advantage of binarizing images? Um, so here I have this image and I've tried to binarize this image. So what binarization has told me is I'm trying to differentiate between the main foreground of the image and the background of the image. How did I do that? I plotted something called as an image histogram. So it tells me all the values between zero and 255 that are present in this image. Then I saw that there are two peaks out here, one peak and two peak. So that means there is a foreground, a distinct foreground or distinct background. I take any value between them and then based on my application, I can move this uh, dotted line a little left or to the right to come up with a binary map like this. So it tells me the foreground is this person with the tripod and some buildings in the background. So if I had to only focus on the uh, tripod and the person and not the 
background i could move the uh, dotted line to the to the left and i would only get this person so it tells me okay foreground background fastest foreground five background uh, identification right so uh, we have we are, most of the time take images and we are interested in how to enhance these images how to look them make them look better if i take a picture of myself i want it to be looking as the best so one of the technique is to increase the brightness of the image. So you, uh, we have the original image here and I want to increase the brightness or also I can decrease the brightness. How do I do that? I take a fixed value. This value is determined by how much brightness or how much darkness I want. So if I add a fixed value to all the pixels from the top to the bottom, I would get a brighter image. So what happened here was if um, if I add any number to this four and make it really large, it became bright. As you can see, 152 is a bright or comparatively a brighter number than the four. So this is the operation that I'm doing for every pixel. And if I wanted to go dark, so I go from 152 to four. So I go, I do a subtraction operation. So you can see the blacks are like more pronounced because dark. And the brighter you can see the 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 clouds are more white compared to the original image so that's how the brightness is being affected the other thing is uh contrast so what is first of all contrast is the ability to differentiate between two different bodies uh, which have a boundary so if i have my hand and my shirt you should be able to differentiate between them because one of them is uh bright and the other one is a dark so based on this you have able to find a boundary so uh, in this image uh, if we multiply your fixed value to every pixel corresponds to adding higher contrast so why uh, so let, let's say bit the gap between the six and four is just two now i multiplied five to six and four so i want to increase the contrast between six and four so it would be 20 out here and 30. Now the difference between them has jumped from just being two numbers to being 10 numbers. So it would, uh, 40 would, uh, yeah, I was multiplying by five, yeah, 20 and this 30. So this would be more grayer compared to this. So the, we can see a, like a really good boundary, which, which was not possible out here. So again, we can lower the contrast this by division. Uh, if you want to see where the contrast is really affected, I would say here is one of the region. Because of high contrast, I can differentiate between the beach and the uh, water. In the lower one, you can see that because I lost some contrast, I can no longer differentiate between the beach and the mountain. So this is how contrast works. Yeah. So the uh, another common technique is edge detection. So we have this. Um, image of a girl and we want to find where are the edges um, or where do these uh, boundary of the hand stop and where does the background start or, or where is the flower or something so one of the um, technique for that is edge detection so it, actually edge detection mathematically is defined as some kind of a discontinuity so you can see that the Ba uh, background no longer exists in the hand and uh, the hand begins here. So there's a discontinuity between the background and the hand because these are different colors and that's why we are able to perceive this. Um, so uh, it, mathematically, it's nothing but my, my left hand limit should not match my right hand limit discontinuity. And um, it is uh, identifiable. So if I take an image, or take a matrix and take a gradient of the matrix is something that what I get here. And why is why does it look like this? We can again go back to this uh, color palette sample. So the diff the gradient between the six and four is small. Let's say just it's just two, but the gradient between four and hundred fifty two is super high. So it's an indicator that there is. Uh, a big jump here so most likely the boundary exists out here there is smaller jumps smaller jumps no boundary 
so boundaries have bigger chance it's um, that's how they are trying to identify the edges so you can see um, like the hair is very different from her face and the edges of the face are super seen one thing that you'll notice is that the leaves are not seen as edges whereas these ridges on her uh, sweater are seen as edges it's because there has been some kind of uh, like this is this image has been taken in portrait mode probably so the background is super blurred so the edges between them have been mixed so there is no kind of edges seen and only that's why when in the focused image in the sweater there are edges seen but not in the background right so uh, other operation is once we have the uh, binary images is the operation of dilation so dilation um, is nothing but to make a image thicker the operation of making thicker is dilation it comes from the word to dilate to increase like uh, our eyes people dilate so they become larger so to make it larger is dilation to make it smaller is erosion so what are some help uh, helpful things why do we need this uh, dilation and erosion so let's say um, this is a j i know this is a j so there is there was no need for me to join the dot of the j to the body of the j but there might be something like uh, like if someone had an image of a like a head and the body but the neck was not somehow captured the head would be separate from the body but it's the same object so we want to merge the head with the body and there we need some kind of a dilation operation similarly it could be like if there were two three people that have come together quite close and we want to separate them we can use erosion so the help of it with the help of erosion we can disconnect joint regions and with the help of dilation we can connect uh, the disjoint regions mm, yeah so the another operation is connected components so if it was a very uh, regular image like say a square or a rectangle i could say that my object just imagine for a second this was a square a gray square i could say that my object lies between uh, these columns and these rows and it would be easy for anyone to identify that but now it's an irregular shape and it's uh, could be like um, irregular size how do i define that so this is where connected component comes in so what happens is um, simply the algorithm comes to this pixel value and says hey is there a neighbor that is gray in color it comes okay yeah this neighbor is gray okay so you are part of this body then it goes again ask the same question hey is a neighbor gray it's like yeah one two three four i have four neighbors gray so they are like okay all of them belong to the same body then comes here ask the same question keeps asking till it like when it will come here it will be like okay yeah this already i have included but there are no more neighbors so i stop so it would all become one body so that would be the red body then it says okay now it goes to other pixel are you uh, are you gray are you gray and then it finds okay yeah okay you are the first gray pixel are you connected to any of my red pixels then it says no then okay i assign you a new color green and then goes about doing the same process all over again to identify this green body this is uh, one of these uh, super interesting things that i think most of you would have taken in your uh, phone cameras the hdr mode in your thing so you can see that um, this is what the hdr image would look like but in the background what happens is when you take an hdr you would have also noticed that the picture takes much longer before they actually are displayed um, so what it does the camera at different exposures take multiple pictures so this is where the camera allows very little light to enter in and it takes one picture little bit more light to enter in one more picture and which allows all the light to enter in so it has three different frames for the same scene for the same scene if you don't move it much of course it has captured three or four images and then it merges all these three images by something called as gamma correction which is the like 
it takes an uh, average and raises it to a gamma value which you defined before and then you come up with this particular image so it's like you can see the brilliance of the image and why does that come because um now so uh, if you see in the background it's super wide so there is a lot of light coming in but from the picture on the bottom very little light comes in so there is a large variation of the light that has come into an image and it's no longer i would say looking desirable and this is not something that our eyes see our eyes see uh, something like these because we perceive we have, we have a much better perception system uh, whereas in this case is the different like it's all dark so this is also not something that our eyes see so it tries to combine multiple pictures to put together something that our eye would have seen so let's uh, see like we have seen some of these techniques uh, how how they are and what uh, they can help us to do so i just put together uh, a demo of an application which is the traffic management system it's also linked to the projects that you would be doing and let's see so here the, the the ppt would be here in the lecture but we are interested in the notebook so if you click here open in collab so you come into collab um so what uh, I try to design this um, kind of a notebook is a vehicle management system. We have a lot of applications where we need to identify moving vehicles in a region. So why, why do we do that? Um, we could be doing it for some kind of traffic management to identify, okay, where the traffic is, or maybe kind of a no stop go toll systems. Uh, or some kind of a driver detection fault or just for surveillance. So we have a lot of cameras all around most cities and we have a lot of footage of uh, traffic. And uh, so these are some of the application that came up from the top of my mind. But of course, with the camera information of videos, uh, it's possible that we can design a lot many different applications. So maybe you can think of some other applications as well. So we've already seen what a video is, right? It's basically nothing but multiple pictures taken quite frequently. So let me download the data. So, so what I'm trying to do is I have a GIF, uh, which is So take some time to load, or maybe I can show the original GIF. So this is what I was downloading. This is the image of a traffic on the highway. You can see the cars coming, some of the cars going, whatever. This is a fixed camera, which has traffic in it. So I have downloaded the traffic video. Um, now I'm trying to read the image. Then, as I said, uh, a video is nothing but different frames being put together. So uh, what I will do is from the video, I try to extract each of the frame and store them in a list. So this is what I'm doing in the first, like the basic attributes of the video. This is what I called it. And I extract all the frames. I will display some of the frames to you. Uh, we identify some properties of the frames and see the image matrix. So let's see, we, we extracted all the frames from the video. Uh, we have stored them in frames. Uh, we are trying to see the number of frames. So this, this video has 150 frames. So the video, this video has 150 frames. Sorry about that. Uh, and so let's try to see some of the frames. So I'm trying to uh, show the first frame and the last frame. Let's maybe change the last frame to some frame in the middle, like maybe the 15th frame. So you can see the 
first frame and the 15th frame. Like, let's look at the shape of the image. So what does it say? 338, 600, and three. So you know that this is an RGB image. So it has three channels, one for the red, one for the green, one for the blue, and it has 338 rows and 600 columns. So let's see how these channels look like. Right, so this is my image, which one I'm showing here is the first frame, right? So the first frame looks like this in our proper color image and I show the red channel. Uh, so you'll notice that white means almost all the colors are, uh, all the colors are available there. So it's, so that's why this one is white here white here and white here. So if all three colors are present there, this becomes white. If neither of three colors are present there, it will become black. So if we find some black regions, so maybe this one. No, so that's not actually black maybe. So uh, this is the red channel of the image, the, the green channel and the blue channel. So maybe the sky is blue, which has more of blue compared to the green and the red. So, so this is how the, the, the one of the channel looks like. So these have got a number should be between always zero and 255 because the data type is unsigned integer eight. So the smallest value is zero and the max is 255. And then now we start with the image processing. Uh, so what we will do is uh, do the simple processes that we have talked about, Con convert a color image to a grayscale image. Uh, we do some kind of an image binarization, uh, connected components labeling to identify different cars and see if we can track these cars and how they move about. So uh, how I do it, because at, uh, uh, at that point I did not have how much I should weight each of the red, blue, or green frames. I just do, did a simple uh, averaging. So I take the red channel divided by three, then take the green channel divided by three and the blue channel divided by three and add them together to give me a gray image. Let me see how the gray image looks like. Yeah, so this is the color image. And now we have the gray scale image of the same. Uh, we did by simple um, averaging technique. Now, um, as we have seen that uh, these different frames capture uh, the position of the car at different location. If we just subtract these two images, we would be able to know which are the things that moved and which did not. So the car, is over here in the next frame, it would be over here. So the difference would be in these two regions. So this would be available here in frame one. In frame two, this would be highlighted. So we're trying to capture that part. So you can see that between two frames, these are the regions where most of the movement has happened. The rest, the movement is insignificant or super low. Now I need to binarize. So I'm telling you, okay, these are the regions which have the cars and the other one. I don't really care about the other background. So I need a foreground and a background. So, so this is what comes up. So these are my cars and they're most likely on the road and the background. You do see some kind of uh, noise and that comes maybe I can, if you notice the tree, the tree also is moving. So it's a noise. It's not really a car that I'm interested in. So we can see how to deal with that also. Now I go about dilating it. You see that these regions, some of the cards for some reason is gray and not purely white. So I just wanted to dilate. Also gives the opportunity to show how dilation works. Um, it helps to remove these kind of noise that was there here, but it did add some noise from the trees and stuff like that. So 
now what i will do is do a connected component labeling so i will say okay this is car one car two whatever these are all connected together and try to uh, remove the ones which are super small so i know this cannot be a car if this was a car so i i know a kind of after trial and error i had found a threshold that if the area in terms of pixels is less than 200 then it most likely is not a car and i should get rid of it so i do some kind of a connected component labeling and then i can show you the labels so yeah so the yellow regions now show us cars and the purple region show us not cars um now let me just to show verify it to you what i do is i take this image and overlay it onto our original image and you can see okay uh, more or less they are like localize the cars really well you can see all the cars buses and you can see the tree is no longer highlighted so it kind of works now i just put everything all together to do this not only for the first and the second frame uh, but for all the frames that are in the image 150 frames so i just run this so this is my function that anyone can use uh, i will load the traffic video again i will identify the vehicles and then save them i save them with 50 fps so anything above 15 should be fine as you've seen mm. so let it run through while it uh, takes some so now we have this annotated gif so okay i still have okay it's loading um maybe i can show you uh, the sample output when i run it before like three days ago so it was so you can see this image uh the blue ones are the uh highlight or uh, the highlighting of the cars you can see that if you see the cars in distance, because I had put a threshold of 200 pixels, those cars in the distance no longer are highlighted as cars anymore. So that's need some kind of more. Uh, mm, yeah, so it's loaded here as well. It needs some kind of other uh, processing which we can think about. Mm, so maybe you can after the after this lecture you can try it out and. Um, one thing you could do is like extend this uh, to count the number of cars that are entering or exiting the uh, entering or exiting the road. So basically, you assume that um, there's an imaginary line somewhere here, and every time one of these big blue boxes cross that imaginary line, you can increase the count. Uh, and one thing is like if you want to add complexity, which I added was like to identify motorcycle. There is one motorcycle that I had seen in this GIF somewhere here, yeah, the motorcycle just, yeah, that's the motorcycle. So this thing in terms of cars are larger, motorcycles are smaller. Maybe you can you find out a threshold specific for motorcycles and uh, can count their motorcycles. Then maybe you can put it into an application like um, if there was a traffic toll gate here how much would be the collection of the toll gate based on the number of cars number of trucks number of motorcycles that pass through maybe you can try that as your homework and you start here yeah so i think i have still have some time so maybe i can talk about the project that is related to this so what we have come up with this project was to kind of identify unruly drivers or um, traffic violators in general. So imagine the traffic police of Bhuvaneshwar, a smart city have reached out to you. Like we have this camera at a different location and you are the data scientist who's supposed to automate, help them identify unruly drivers. So some of the examples of unruly drivers that I had put was the one who changes lanes unnecessary. You, here in this one, you can see that pretty much everyone follows the lane and uh, it does not change lane um, unnecessarily so but you can identify uh, how do how do you go about lane identification like first of all you see this uh, white patches that are fixed are most likely the lane so come up with an algorithm that defines what the lane is identify how people crossing the lane can be defined when the white patches intersect with the blue blobs there's some kind of a uh, traffic violation 
uh, easy one is uh, wrong side of the road. So for example, I know if any blue patch is there on this road, it should be moving towards me and not away from me. So that's the wrong side. Uh, it would be super nice if you could identify if people are breaking the speed limit. How would you calculate speed? It's like you have instead of one imaginary line to calculate the number of uh, points. Now imagine there are two lines, one line here and one line at the board marker here. Now you can uh, try to um, guess the distance between the two imaginary lines and what would be the time taken for one block to travel from point A to B uh, if, if they are within the speed limit and if they are doing it faster, you can identify it. Right, so this is what um, some, the, the task would be that you identify an unruly driver instead of the blue box, put them as red. And if they're a good driver, give them a green box. If a driver turns from bad to green, or bad to good or good to bad, you can change the colors accordingly. Uh, and maybe you can also have some kind of uh, a system that can zoom in to highlight the number plates of the. So it's not possible from this particular video because this particular video is made in such a way that you cannot identify number plates, but uh, that's something that's also possible. So this is the uh, demo that I wanted to show. Now I have, I think, a um, couple of slides more, which has you can finish. Right, so I just wanted to give an outlook on CNNs. So how does all the uh, algorithms that we see before help in CNNs? So CNNs have basically two parts. One is the convolutional part and the other one is the fully connected part. So the task of the convolutional part is to extract features from the image. And the uh, task of the fully connected part is like, I take these features, based on these features, I need to make a decision. So the decision part is based, is done in the fully connected network. So I'm not bothered about that. As a CV person, I'm more bothered about here because this is still common with all the application, CV or not. Uh, so how can I extract features? So this is all happening automatically, but uh, what it does is, is basically one of the operation that we have seen before. So this particular channel could have been, if, if we knew what it's doing, but as of now, we have no way to tell it. So this could be just a uh, thresholding, or this could be just connected component labeling. And we know for sure that the pooling operations are nothing but resize operation. So it's basically combination of all the basic operation that we have seen done successively over different layers. So layer one, layer two, layer three. Once we go about doing it multiple times, we though we lose track of what exactly the operation has because we, we might have done thresholding here uh, and then did a pooling and then we do some kind of a connected component there uh, or a dilation. Uh, overall, we will not be able to identify what is a dilated or connected component or what happened, but all these are operation that kind of stack up. So I think um, when we have the introduction to deep learning, you will see exactly how uh, these um, things are working. But just to keep in mind, these are nothing but the same operations. It's just, we cannot interpret which channel is what operation, but it's a combination of all the operations that we have seen before. So all this while I have talked to you about computer vision, but they were mostly focused on 3D computer vision. So, sorry, they were focused on 2D computer vision. Uh, now I just wanted to give you an outlook on 3D computer vision. Um, I assume uh, most of you are uh, engineering students, so you must have uh, at least attended some classes of engineering drawing. So given a 3D object, you would have drawn something like this. The front view, the, the, the left profile view, the top view and one of other view called the isometric view. So this is the most common thing that maybe most of you have anyways drawn as well in your engineering colleges. So if I had a rabbit on my table, I would have drawn this, but um, it's also possible that I can represent that rabbit 
as point clouds. So they are just some points that define the the the, the outer body of the rapid. So point clouds, voxels um, is um, like it's pixels but in 3D. So entire body of the rabbit could have been uh, like imagine instead of a 2D matrix, a 3D matrix, and each of the point uh, where the rabbit is present is marked as one, rest of the points are marked as zero. So that's voxel grid. Um, it's also possible as meshes, right? And um, also depth maps. I'm not really bothered about um, what the exact boundary is, which all these other techniques are talking about, and just caring about the depth. So. So this is the most important application in terms of the iPhone camera. Uh, so what they do is take a normal picture and they also have the depth information coming from other sensors and apply it to get like those 3D images that you have from uh, iPhone camera, which is most useful for uh, the AR, VR, augmented reality or virtual reality applications. So these, these 3D computer vision algorithms are super important for self-driving cars. Also like some of them have kind of a LIDAR or a radar unit mounted on top of them. This is an example from the Google car, which used to have them. And based on the LIDAR or radar, it builds a point cloud um, mapping of its vicinity. So it will have this car as a point cloud and it, it knows, okay, I don't have to go into any of the point cloud. I have to navigate the region based on uh, the point clouds which are empty, right? And then this is a 3D scanner. So you can see that I just wanted to put how they make these images kind of a thing. So you put this big, um, small statue of the goblin out here and then this rotates. There's a camera taking pictures at every point. And then based on this, there's some processing algorithms that make it point clouds, and these are all mostly interconvertible among themselves. So remember that it's not only 2D vision, which is normal plane camera, but it also can be 3D as in LIDAR, radar, um, or here like a 3D scanner. So what did we see till now is like, what is computer vision? Why computer vision is hard? What is an image? What is a video? We just looked about what are the major image processing techniques and how these multiple tasks can come together to form an application, the application of the vehicle identification. And I think that's the end of the introduction to computer vision. I think now I think we can go for some questions if you have. So please put the questions in the chat. Um, so I'm just scrolling to the top just to see if I have um, some questions. So, sir, uh, uh, there are a few questions like uh, mm -hmm. which programming la language does computer vision support and which is the best for this algorithm? All right. So, um, so all the examples that I have shown, um, maybe you can go to one of them. So something like this is uh, when Sony came up, the primary programming language people were using was MATLAB. But uh, nowadays, this is accessible in any programming language. You can use JavaScript, Python is most widely used, but you can use any of these programming language. Um, so it is possible that whatever language that you are comfortable in, most computer vision uh, libraries are available. And most famous one is OpenCV. You must have seen, I also used OpenCV. I use Python for my implementation because I'm most comfortable with it. But Open CVs are also available in uh, MATLAB and C++, whatever you are comfortable with. Okay, so one more question is from Amit Kumar Malik that uh, what is the basic difference between RGB and PNG images? Right, so... Mm. 
so i i was talking about um so most images like the jpg image which is the other one compared to png does not have the alpha channel right so this is a jpg image so you can see um, there is no concept of transparency if this was a, a a png image i could have specified that this white region needs to be transparent and not white which you can see out here so png has an additional channel so it's four channel image where an alpha is specified like the transparency of this region should be high and that's why i can see the image behind it also so if i place it uh, wherever so this is one more query from the same amit kumar malik uh, the uh, significance of x axis and y axis in the histogram um the sign the significance also i can go to that mm. yeah that uh, right i should have the x it. and y axis so here the um the x axis is the pixel values so that zero for all the pixels that have value zero and how many of these pixels are there are on the y so if uh, there, there is possible only pixels between 0 and 255 so the number 255 has close to right now 0 pixels whereas the number say be 190 has close to um 4500 pixels in this entire image yeah I I should have have put this in number of pixels. Yes, sir. Uh, is Amit. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. I have few more questions uh, I want to ask. Um, uh, sir, actually, as you told that PNG has four channels. Okay. So now, and uh, we know that the JPG format is RGB only. It has three channels. We are converting PNG to JPG. How we are dealing with that uh, fourth channel? So what about this? yeah so i think the conversion of png to jpg is the simplest because basically we just have to get rid of the um, transparent regions and make it white okay right so okay. the other way is difficult because you may have a normally occurring white region in the image as well right this white is normally occurring so um it may not be super easy but what it does is basically remove all the white regions from the boundaries So it finds a white region from the boundary, and it says that is my transparent channel. Okay. But from PNG to JPG is fairly easier. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, one more question. Sir, uh, as you uh, explained that uh, when we are converting the RGB to grayscale image, we are taking uh, generally mm -hmm. average of three channel. Am I right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sir, uh, suppose I have never tried. Uh, we are simply using that uh, OpenCV uh, syntax to convert RGB to grayscale. Is it possible to convert gray to RGB? Because if you have some pipe information, we can take the average. But from average to specific pipe information, I don't think it is uh, difficult. I have never tried. It. I just want to ask: Is it possible? So I can show you the code that uh, I used to. This is the the most simplest kind of a. So if you don't use OpenCV RGB to gray or something, so you can use. Where is this one? So I had you seen right? Divided the red channel by three, yes. The green channel by three, and uh, yeah. So this is something. Yeah, red by three, green by three, blue by three. It's also possible that you can take the average, right, and put it in in each of the channel. It would also be a okayish looking um, image. Uh, no sir, my point is gray to RGB. Suppose uh, and now our information is reduced uh, after converting from RGB to gray. Gray. Now suppose mm -hmm. I want to go back. Is it uh, mm -hmm. possible or I lost the information of that uh, three channel? You, you you have lost information for sure, but it's possible to get back some of the information. Okay. So uh, is there any uh, syntax in OpenCV to convert, or uh, it is not there? Just like RGB to gray, we have direct syntax. So. Yeah, but I uh, I have not actually used any application where we do it. But what is possible is like we uh, we saw that how we went from left to right, right. Mm -hmm. So now I take this image, right, and I just paste it here, here, here. Then this becomes my blue. The same image is becoming my blue. Same is becoming my green. Some same is becoming my red. So I do lose some information out here. 
it will not look really good it will be looking really horrible uh, but it is not a uh, because you have lost so much information uh, it might not look at, at all good at all i mean it would look not normal okay so, yeah i have never tried it but uh, i don't know the syntax i will not be able to tell you that uh, sir one more question uh, sir uh, you also explained that edge detection by taking so low value and a high value of the pixels so uh, recently i was going through some research papers there is i think there are different types of edge detection method like shani sobel and some others also are uh, able to recall so what are the basic difference between and what are the mathematics behind this and whatever you have explained that is based on which uh, uh, method shani or sobel or any other so the one which i am told is gradient one is based on the sobel it's actually sobel is more sophisticated gradient than the simple gradient that i was talking about but okay. to be honest this is just the uh, like the all of the techniques that i've told about are just the tip of the uh, algorithm this is the most simplest explainable algorithm but there are more sophisticated algorithms based on the application you can find the sophisticated algorithms which are suitable for you and use it and most of the thing why you don't have to uh, code from scratch is because libraries like open cv allow you to import it as a single line and use it but you need to know okay this, what is it doing is basically a edge detection what is the concept of edge detection is i am finding discontinuity uh, that is but uh, if someone asks me that what is the uh, difference between sobel and canny i don't know about the mathematics behind this so uh, how to explain no, so, yeah so you, the thing is um, uh you will have to know the mathematics to uh, uh explain the difference behind it right because there are two different mathematical operator being applied here image so you have to know the difference to be able to or you have to know the mathematics to be able to differentiate between them okay and uh, sir another question that point cloud regarding point cloud uh, said the way we, we detected we got the bounding box in rgb channel so as you, as you told i also know that uh, in all, although the object is there within the bounding box but apart from that we have also some background point present on in, inside that bounding and you are doing the instant segmentation or something so in point cloud how can we do the instant segmentation uh, suppose we have our ob point cloud of our object and also the point cloud of the background so how we want to remove that background so what are the methods yeah so that's what i have not actually talked about at all right because i am no expert in 3d computer vision so that is a domain of the 3d computer vision the segmentation of point clouds there is uh, uh, the background and the foreground there which i mm -hmm. will not be able to answer okay thank you thank you sir all right I think no more question in the chat box. Any other question from the audience? I think maybe not because that, uh, anyways, no I... other questions are there. Right. Also, I have taken maybe five minutes yeah, extra yeah. over time. So yeah, I think it's okay. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, so if I think uh, no more question, maybe, yeah, so Susan said maybe they can announce the end of this session and uh, also about the next session. Okay. Uh, uh, Sudan you will. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Mr. Abhijit Parida, for delivering his talk on computer vision and uh, to all the audience who were presented. So our next session will start at 12.30 uh, and uh, the lecturer will be Mr. Prabhu Teja. So I request you all, you can leave the meeting and uh, we can start at uh, sharp 12 p.m. Sorry, 12 p.m. Yeah, it will be 12 p.m. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, uh, at sharp at 12 p.m. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all.